Good morning. I sense there's going to be a lot of noise in the room today, but in a really positive way. Um, Magnus has his Apple Watch and it will tell us how loud we're being. So he can let us know at lunchtime and at the end of the day and hopefully it will escalate. But it's all really happy noise. And I just wanted to welcome you all to Stratford upon Avon, the centre of um, excellence. Um, Really, I'm just astounded how many people have come so far as well. And I really want this to be quite an unusual medical conference. I don't want it to be stuffy. I don't want it to be inhibited. Clearly, for declarations, we have no association with any farmer. So this is put on through Newson Health, our company. Um, I just want people to enjoy it, actually. I've been to a lot of conferences over the years, quite a few more recently, where I've absolutely hated them. There's a few conferences that I've not ever been to without crying. So I'm not going to cry today. I'm going to be happy, but I want everyone else to really enjoy it and get what you want out of it. Because there's nothing worse than going to a conference and thinking, now that was a complete waste of a day. So just, just challenge, enjoy, let's have lots of discussion. Um, I very bravely put my email address on here because I don't get enough emails. I clearly want more. <laughs> um, but I'm really conscious that some of you might not want to um, or not have time to or just, just want to ask something. And as many of you know, I spend my life on emails and I'm really happy to engage or direct. So um, I'm very happy for you to take a note of that. So Stratford-upon-Avon, the centre of England, we are not that far away from London, but for those people that live in London, think it's quite far away. So um, just to show you where it is. And obviously Shakespeare, um, it's Shakespeare's country. It's a beautiful place to work. Um, I don't live too far away, but it is lovely. But we want to make it the menopause capital of the world so we can forget about Shakespeare. Um, so... What are the barriers to good medical menopause care? If there was good menopause care, I would be having a very different life. I might be seeing my husband and children a bit more often. I might be going on holiday without working. But there are so many. And this was a quote from the all-party parliamentary group um, last year. And it's got words such as sexism, ageism in them. The support, so it's not even treatment, just support. That's all we need as menopausal women to get us on the first rung of the ladder, if you like, towards treatment. It's only 13 million of us. It's not really a health concern. It's not really a problem. There's only 1.2 billion of us worldwide. The majority of women are not receiving treatment. Yet it's not really mentioned as a problem. It's just a lifestyle thing. It's just a transition, apparently, that we go through. But I believe that there are barriers, and so uh, Rebecca and I, when we set up our small clinic that we wanted to do <laughs> in Stratford four years ago, it was just to try and help address some of these barriers. Some of you might have seen, this is the most beautiful building that Rebecca and I found. It used to be the registry office in Stratford, um, and we found it, but it didn't look like that on the inside. It was very dark and damp with horrible green um, carpet everywhere. And if I knew what I knew now, I wouldn't have opened it because we had no business plan, we had no business sense. Sorry, Rebecca, but I think you'll agree. Um, but we just had lots of enthusiasm and we knew we wanted to help some women. We thought we'd just have four of us working in the clinic, um, not 118 of us, not seeing thousands of women a month. We thought we'd just see a few people. But the demand has been huge and um, the response has been huge. Um, and it's been really an incredible place to work, and the team that I work with, obviously, are amazing. Uh, I don't want to be treating 13, 14 million women uh, from the UK in, the, uh, in my clinic, so we developed the Balance app, which is free, and it's always going to be free, um, and this is just what we do through it. Um, hopefully, you all know it and recommend it, um, and we're adding and changing and optimising it all the time. I just wanted to remind us all, actually, this sounds really stupid, what the menopause is. When you look it up, and I've spent a lot of time looking it up, trying to really get the definition, we can break down the men, men uh, not, not men get away, obviously, but men, um, menstrual cycle and pause is a stop. But I cannot think of anything else in medicine that you have to wait for a year before you diagnose. It's a retrospective diagnosis. So it's about menstruation. It's about the end of our fertility. 
and it's when our ovaries stop producing eggs. So it's all a bit bikini medicine-ish, isn't it? Um, but actually, I don't really care as a 52-year-old woman who's had a hysterectomy where my last period was. And actually, I don't really care about reproduction because it would be a bit amazing to become pregnant age 52 and also without a womb. <laughs> but I'm still menopausal, but it's not a transition. I'm not sure what I'm transitioning in or to when I'm menopausal, which is what some people sort of talk about and it's this natural process and I'm not going to go into this in any detail but we all know that there are lots of natural things there's a whole philosophical um, argument about what aging is there's lots of um, conditions that are natural being in pain is natural but I really quite like taking painkillers but we need to think about our hormones really really important and despite what some people think it is a hormone deficiency you don't have to have no hormones to have a deficiency we have iron deficiency but we still have some iron, but it's lower than normal. So we need to think about the role of hormones. And this is just to wake you all up in the morning, thinking about estradiol and its effect on immune cells. I've got a pathology and immunology degree, and this is one of my favorite slides, <laughs> but I'm not going to talk through it. But I just want to show you that estrogen affects every immune cell that we have. And this is a, another very busy slide, again, to wake you up. I've put lots of different colors on to make it look more beautiful. But if we think about inflammation, the diseases of inflammation are the ones that globally are affecting most women. So we're thinking about cardiovascular disease, we're thinking about Alzheimer's disease, also thinking about cancers are due to inflammation as well. Also thinking about type 2 diabetes, me uh, metabolic syndrome, obesity, even fatty liver. It's all there, it's all listed, including Parkinson's, you know, inflammatory bowel disease and so forth. But what is, what, there's lots of reasons why we get inflammation. We know if people don't eat well, if they don't exercise, if they don't sleep well. But actually, what about estradiol? Estradiol is very, very anti-inflammatory. You saw on the last slide. This is where we need to be thinking, and no disrespect to the gynecologists in the room, I'm not sure many of them will have thought in this way because they're just thinking about the pelvic organs. And some of the challenges is that I get is because I'm thinking a bit beyond the box. But I think this is a really important slide for us to consider. So we're trying not just in Stratford to help people, we're trying to go globally. I just wanted to show you, because I'm really proud of the team, that we're nearly, nearly a million downloads of balance. Over 215 countries, we've had lots of health reports um, downloaded and two and a half million views of the app each week. You know, it's busy. That's because women need help. But it's not just about me, any of this. Um, this is just a few pictures from what's gone on over the last uh, a few weeks or so. Um, we went to Florence, we're presenting some research. The, the, the picture at the top is um, some women that work for Sophia Forum, an HIV charity for some work that we've done. I got an email from the CEO yesterday, said they've run out of booklets again. Can we have some more? And they've been translated into different African languages. Um, this is some of my team next to my book who decided to dress in the book covers, <laughs> colours, which um, was very sweet. Um, my book launch had lots of people who, again, they're not just supporting me, they're supporting the whole mission, which is incredible. Um, <clears throat> on the bottom right is my mum and my sister. My mother, who's the great HRT champion, came to support me in Bath on Monday night. And on the top right, you might not recognise us, but that's Rebecca and me in Iceland, <laughs> um, trying to stay up in the horizontal winds and uh, and weather and we've got some Icelandic colleagues here as well too, so we need to make them sure they feel very welcome um, and then the bottom picture is actually something that's is probably the most exciting project that we've done so Claire Phipps and Amy who are here today had um, a workshop with women about FGM so this is a charity um, that Dan connected us with and they just did some work I cannot imagine what these women's perineums are like when they're menopausal and they don't really have anywhere to talk to so as an organization we're not just about prescribing HRT we're about trying to help in a really holistic way um, just also what I wanted to, I was thinking this morning, I did yoga this morning, I do yoga quite a lot in the morning, and somebody said, uh, that I was doing a Peloton yoga class, and the guy um, said, every move is actually a test of your focus. I thought, all right, yeah, you're right, you're absolutely right. And I think I've got to stay really focused with a lot of noise that's going on to me, but we've all got to stay focused and remember what we're doing, remember the good that we're doing, because there is a lot of good that we're doing. And as I changed my patches today, 
I hate to tell you that I wear 300 micrograms of estradiol because if I wear less, I have migraines and I have joint pain. But I don't have a womb, so I'm not quite sure what the risks are. I'm sure someone somewhere might be able to tell me. But actually, my estradiol level is not raised. And this is something that I just wanted to mention about levels and doses because it's coming up more and more, especially with the news alert, with Royal College and, and so forth. So in the question and answer session at the end, the open one, that's where I'm going to talk about it. So the, the individual HRT, just talk about other things because I want it to be a discussion, it's a two-way, um, but I think it's really important that I acknowledge now that we're going to talk about it later because I think that's a really, really good thing to, um, to discuss and have out there. Finally, it's not just about menopause or women. What I'm really trying to do in a lot of my work is embrace people who are young, people who are not thinking about the menopause, but should be, because it's going to happen to them or it's already happening to someone that they know or love um, who's either in their household or maybe at school. I went to parents' evening last night and um, my 12-year-old said to me, maths teacher, mummy, just be careful. She's really not... <laughs> And uh, so I went down and the teacher was very lovely, telling me how clever my daughter was, all very nice. But I did look at her straw hair and her little, little moustache that she had. <laughs> so um, I did say to, so, to Lucy, um, do you think she probably needed a bit of, bit of um, HRT? She said, mummy, mummy, just be quiet. But you're probably right. So just finally, these are my three children who uh, prop me up a lot. And um, they're the people that we need to be educating as well as the older ones. So that's them absolutely enthralled with balance app of course <laughs> so last time we did a conference in september we did the mental health section at the end of the day we're doing it at the beginning to really depress you clearly <laughs> um but you know what there's so much going on about hrt there's so much going on about the risks one of the reasons that I get up every morning and go to work is the stories that I hear. 98% of people that come to our clinic have psychological symptoms. It's those psychological symptoms that really distress me. We see a lot of women who are suicidal, a lot of women whose symptoms really improve. So this is, all the sessions today are important, but this is really important. So I'm very grateful for Claire to facilitate it and, and our speakers. So thank you again. And thanks for coming. So the first speaker we've got for the mental health session is Dr. Hannah Ward. Thanks, Claire. So my case history is actually a personal account of my journey through hormonal depression and how I came to find HRT as a solution. It's been packed away at the back of my mind for many years, as I really didn't want to think about it, let alone talk about it, until I came to work for Newson Health three years ago. And I realised that the only way for us to learn and progress is to share our stories. I know I'm not unique and that many women and doctors suffer and struggle with their hormones and their mental health in the same way that I have done. Yet many of them may not recognise why this is, and if they do realise it is their hormones, they're not being offered the appropriate solutions and they feel powerless to find the right answers. So I hope that by sharing my story, other women will be able to access the help and support that they so desperately need. I was born in the 70s, raised in the 80s and went to medical school in the 90s. I had a fortunate childhood with minimal adversity and there was nothing to suggest that I may suffer with mental health problems in the future. I loved everything about medical school and graduated in 1998, excited for my career ahead. After house jobs on the South Coast, where I also met my future husband, I completed a medical rotation and membership before switching to general practice, as I found I lacked the stamina needed for those long 56-hour weekends and weeks of nights. Perhaps this was the first sign of things to come. It was not until I had my children that the problems really started. I was pregnant with my first daughter when I turned 30 and I was a GP registrar. I knew that I felt really very well as we were lucky enough to go to Australia for the Rugby World Cup finals and I felt strangely calm on the many flights we needed to take. Previously, I may have been an anxious and sweaty wreck due to my fear of flying. I didn't really think any more about it, and after a slightly traumatic delivery and a few days in special care, we got into our stride and found those first few months 
the honeymoon period. While all my NCT friends were struggling with sleepless nights, breastfeeding dilemmas and the baby blues, our lives were blissful. Unfortunately, this did not last. Around about the four-month mark, just when weaning began, I started to feel incredibly anxious and irritable and tearful. My biggest problem was I couldn't sleep, and for many nights, I did not sleep at all. Many of the symptoms were physical, with excruciating muscle pains, persistent headaches, night sweats, and extreme fatigue. I continued to breastfeed until the symptoms became intolerable. My daughter became fractious and hungry and irritable, and I felt forced to give up feeding her at around about six months. This all coincided with returning to work as a newly qualified GP in a different practice, where I had very little support or nurturing, and I remember being left on my own in a branch surgery on my first day back from maternity leave. The word induction didn't seem to exist, and I hoped that really wouldn't happen these days. I was only working two days a week as a retainer, but life became a real struggle, and I was pretty miserable for many months. I longed to become pregnant again, as I knew that I would feel well. Twelve months after the onset of what was in hindsight postnatal depression, but I had not realised it at the time, I was pregnant again and back to normal and really well. The following year, my son was born and the same pattern seemed to emerge. Four months of bliss while breastfeeding and the menstrual clock was turned off, followed by the onset of oestrogen deficiency symptoms again. I knew as I lay in bed awake, unable to sleep, sweating profusely, going to the toilet six times a night, that these were menopausal symptoms. Of course, I had only just passed my MRCGP with flying colours. But I was 33 and would never consider HRT, as my mother had had bilateral breast cancer at the age of 45. And it was 2006, soon after the WHI, so of course HRT was dangerous and out of the question back then. I did, however, pick up a packet of the combined contraceptive pill, thinking that maybe that might, might do the trick, but I never took them. Still, I had not sought help and not acknowledged that I had a problem. I was brought up in a family where you were taught to pull your socks up, get on with things. After all, my mother had been evacuee from the Channel Islands in the Second World War, and we were constantly reminded how lucky we were not to be on rations. Mental health was not discussed or tolerated, and generally was brushed under the carpet. Yet I was beginning to realise that I had a mental health problem, and at the time, the only option I knew of were SSRIs, which I did not want to take. So I started St John's Wort, which helped a bit, and moved on with daily life. I blamed my mood on my job, and I found a new practice. Two years on, and much to everyone's surprise, I was pregnant again. Apparently, I was so miserable, they all thought that I'd stop at two, yet no one had ever cared to mention to me that I thought I might be unwell. The third time, I convinced myself things would be better. Life was different. We had a cleaner and a nanny, and my husband was a consultant, and we were financially secure. I had none of the known risk factors for postnatal depression, yet here I was again with a four-month-old baby, plus a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and my mental health was deteriorating rapidly. Whatever I tried exercise, supplements, melatonin. I even bought a ridiculously expensive mind spa machine to try and help me sleep. Nothing seemed to work. I regularly visualised throwing myself downstairs or stabbing myself with a kitchen knife, and every waking hour was painful. Even the few moments of sleep were filled with nightmares about my children dying in a horrific accident. I could not go on like this. So I saw the GP and started sertraline, which was the only option that I thought was available to me at the time. It was an absolute disaster. And suffice to say, I had to be collected by my father from the hard shoulder of the M25, otherwise I feared I would drive off into a ditch. Those three weeks on sertraline were honestly the worst three weeks of my life. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, and I was beside myself. I felt so ill, I was convinced I had Addison's disease and even resorted to going back to Kumar and Clark textbook to see if I could work out the physiology of what was going on. So I stopped the sertraline and I started to Google. It was 2010. 
I found a really helpful leaflet by the Association of Postnatal Illness on PND and wondered why it would advise women not to take the contraceptive pill. So I spoke to a good friend from medical school who was also a GP and going through postnatal depression and we determined it must be the progestin element. And this led me to stumbling onto the work of Dr. Catherine Dalton and the use of cyclogest high-dose progesterone pessaries for postnatal depression, PMS and PMDD. The case histories online convinced me that this was my answer, and it was. The very next day, I opened the BNF and slightly surprised and aghast, there they were, licensed for this very use. So I self-prescribed some Cyclogest 400 twice a day, and within 24 hours, I was back to normal. Why didn't I know this information as a medical professional and GP? It should have been part of my training. I understand that this treatment was used in the 80s and 90s, but had fallen out of fashion, and I was basically 10 years too late. I returned to work the following week at seven months postnatal, only one week, week later than originally planned, thinking to myself that this was the end of it, but how wrong could I be? Four or five months later, my periods returned, and with them, awful cyclical mood symptoms. I struggled to work. I crashed my car. I remember taking 40 milligrams of tamazepam one night and having still not slept, got up, drove into work and carried on as if everything was normal. The rest of the team were completely oblivious as I was too ashamed and too embarrassed to admit that I was struggling. By this time, I had done so much reading about hormones and depression that I knew I needed oestrogen as well. So I booked in to see Professor Studd in London and started on oestrogel and testosterone. Back in those days, he was using cyclical synthetic norethisterone, five milligrams for seven days of the month, which I stopped after only one tablet, as it made me extremely agitated and I wanted to jump out of the window. So I made up my own regime of HRT using oestrogel and cyclogest pessaries, and slowly but surely, I started to get better. Always knowing that I now had reproductive or hormonal depression, which would return in the perimenopause. So it was no surprise to me that eight years later, at the age of 44, six months after my mother had died of breast cancer, that all my symptoms returned again. And it was time to restart the hormonal support. This time I did go to the GP and was offered antidepressants, which I knew would never work for me. So I asked for HRT and started on Everol, gradually increasing my dose from 50 to 100 to 200, and now more than 300 were in competition, Louise knowing that this is what I needed to do to get better. As I said at the start, I know I'm not unique, and this story of hormonal depression is repeated throughout the UK and beyond. We hear these stories all the time at Newson Health, but I'm fortunate that I had enough medical knowledge to work out what was happening, to seek out the appropriate sort, uh, support that I needed to get better, or even to treat myself. I'm not sure the GMC would recommend that, even if it took me three days three goes to sort it out. I will forever be indebted to Dr. Dalton and Professor Studd for their work on hormones and depression and sharing their knowledge, research and experience to help women in the same way that Louise will forever be remembered by so many women for saving their lives too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, and our next speaker is Dr. Rebecca Lewis, and she's going to talk to us about mental health and female hormones. Thank you very much for that lovely presentation. That was really um, humbling to listen to and very useful for us all, I think. So, hello, everybody. Um, it's um, lovely to be here and see so many people. So I'm going to be talking about mental health and female hormones. As Louise said, um, I'm a GP and menopause specialist and helped Louise set up the clinic uh, four years, five years ago now. I have no financial declarations. As Louise has said, we do not do any paid work with pharma. I'm a director of Newson Health and director of the Free Balance app and director of Newson Health Research and Education, which is a not-for-profit company. So we need to talk about um, our hormones and what's going on through our through our lifestyle, really, through all our um, through our lives. You can see the red dotted line is estradiol levels, um, and how that can 
rise and, and fluctuate a little bit in our teens. And then as we uh, pass puberty and have regular periods, in general, the oestradiol levels are flattening off and become much more stable. The progesterone levels up and down, which can cause problems with PMD and PMT, PMS. Um, and then we enter perimenopause, and we can see how our oestradiol levels are really fluctuating there. Um, very high levels, naturally. Um, we often see when people aren't on HRT, naturally they'll have levels of 3,000 or 4,000, because the ovary is beginning to fail. And as it fails, it produces very, very high levels for a moment. Uh, it can't sustain those high levels, and then they plunge down. And these, this fluctuation is really uh, hard for women to cope with. You can see how chaotic the graph looks in the perimenopause of the Easter dial levels. This is what is happening in the body. It's a chaotic time. It's a vulnerable time because we have Eastern receptors everywhere on every single cell of our body um, and these fluctuations are often particularly bad for our mood um, for migraines for example um, this rapid cycling is not is not good the body really wants a nice regular stable secure supply of estradiol and of course the menopause our estradiol levels flatten off they're still there but they're, they're lower and uh, more more flattened the progesterone levels also um, uh, reduce uh, with the perimenopause as we d fail to ovulate. One hormone that's not on there is testosterone, which is uh, produced in much higher dose than estradiol and uh, progesterone even. And that begins to fail. Uh, our production begins to fail in our late 20s, early 30s. Um, so that declines and declines. And the main source of, produce, of production of, is, of testosterone is the ovary. We also get some from the adrenals. Um, but the main source is, is ovary. So that is beginning to fail in our 30s. As I said earlier, the influence of estrogen is everywhere. It gets all over the body, the brain, heart, liver, bones, of course, um, joints, muscles. There's not a, not a cell really that doesn't respond to, to estrogen. And likewise, testosterone, which is forgot, the forgotten hormone. Uh, we have uh, testosterone levels, 10% uh, of the levels that men have, and it's a very important hormone, um, especially for you know, bone density, muscle and strength, and our brain, really important for cognitive performance. Um, and a lot of people have found that actually testosterone helps hot flushes and night sweats as well. So it gets everywhere. It's a, another important hormone which has been not studied and researched properly. <laughs> This is our brain, and you can see the abundance of estradiol and testosterone receptors everywhere in the frontal cortex to do with our personal personality and decision making. Um, the limbic system, of course, is really vital for our mood, our concentration, memory, libido, fatigue. The hypothalamus is our th natural thermostat um, and uh, appetite uh, center, if you like. The cerebellum to do with fine motor control, as you know. And it's quite interesting. A lot of women do describe that they become more clumsy in the perimenopause and menopause. It's a small symptom. They don't go to the GPs with that, but they find that they're more clumsy um, and uh, their fine motor skills have deteriorated. So very important hormone. We know that estradiol is, a, is the modulator and um, controls the levels of neurotransmitters, serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine. Um, and these are really key neurotransmitters, especially with our mood. Um, and estradiol, and in fact, progesterone and testosterone all have neuroprotective effects on the brain. Um, it acts as a serotonergic agonist. Um, and it, it increases the levels of, of um, postsynaptic serotonin, very much like antidepressants, the SSRI um, uh, group of antidepressants. And it's been called uh, nature's psychoprotectant. It is that important for our brains. We've heard from Hannah how dramatically her brain was affected by the change in hormones. So very important. It's also important progesterone, which helped Hannah in her story with her severe PMDD, uh, we know that that acts on the GABA receptor, very important for anxiolysis and sleep. Um, and we know that uh, testosterone deficiency gives rise to dysphoric mood, increased anxiety, poor sleep and irritability. And all these hormones will be low in the perimenopause and menopause, of course. 
And these are the symptoms of testosterone deficiency. We don't really think about that, do we? we th it's it, how important it is with our brains. Um, a lack of well-being, feeling exhausted the whole time, um, loss of joy, enthusiasm for things. Our muscles become weaker. Um, sarcopenia, um, osteoporosis, um, insomnia, hot flushes as well. So again, a very important hormone, but all we seem to know about is how it affects libido. Yes, it does affect libido. It is important libido, of course it is. But also all those other uh, symptoms are, are, are just as important, if not more, for some, for some women. Let's just remind ourselves of psychological symptoms of the menopause. And as Louise said, 98% of women who come to our clinic will have symptoms. Um, I haven't actually met a woman in perimenopause who hasn't had a degree of an increase in levels of anxiety. Um, it may be just mild. Um, and, and as we know, these symptoms can vary enormously from person to person. So some people can just have very mild symptoms and other women are on their knees with, with symptoms. Their anxiety is so profound, they can't leave the house, uh, they're not driving, they can't work. All these symptoms I'm sure you're well aware of, panic attacks. And this is often uncharacteristic, hasn't happened before. And of course, we must remember the physical symptoms as well. But there are things people don't think about that hot flushes and night sweats will never occur in 20%. Um, and some people are waiting for that as the cardinal sign that they are menopausal. And yet they've got every other symptom going and it's delaying their diagnosis. Muscle and joint pains. Some women, you know, misdiagnosed with fibromyalgia, seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. The, the joint pains can be really profound. Um, migraines, of course, tinnitus um, affects the uh, nerve transmission. Uh, so tinnitus and pins and needles, very common. Poor memory and concentration. A lot of women obviously very worried that they've got early onset dementia, um, and it's not. So I want to introduce this term reproductive depression, which you may or may not have heard about. And uh, following on really from our last speaker, this is, this is what happens through a, a life the lifestyle of, of women. They, we can see problems with PMS, PMDD, these fluctuations of uh, low progesterone and low estrogen levels in the luteal phase can really give rise to quite a lot of symptoms in some people. Um, postnatal depression, again, when our estradiol levels plummet after the birth of the baby. And then perimenopausal depression or mood disorder of the menopause, as we often call it as well, because some people will be affected with mood problems but may not be severe enough to be called depression. Other people can be so affected that they are sadly suicidal um, and are in psychiatric units receiving ECT because their uh, depression is treatment resistant, uh, because no one's thought about hormones. So the, having these things on one's radar, if you have a patient who've always had problems with PMS or postnatal depression, we have to be on high alert that they may have a difficult time um, with the menopause and their mood. The premenstrual symptoms, symptoms uh, in the lead up to the periods in the luteal phase of our, of our cycle uh, with psychological distress, anxiety, irritability, um, and physical as well, a lot of bloating um, and breast tenderness. Um, PMDD is the more extreme form of this disorder. And the cause really is the low estradiol levels or low progesterone levels. The progesterone levels really plummet uh, just before the period. And as Hannah has said, high dose progesterone, as advised by Catherine Dalton, does help quite a lot of women. Postnatal depression is not uncommon, occurs in 10 to 15% of women. Um, and I think anyone who's seen that can see the power of hormones, how women who've been very well can suddenly... Uh, be, become deluded, um, have thoughts of self-harm to themselves and the baby. Um, and in fact, this is the most risky time um, for murder is, um, uh, is, is under the age of one, um, infanticide by your mother is one of the most, uh, the, the riskiest time of being, of being killed, um, which is quite a shocking statistic. And this is what hormones can do to female brains, um, are the lack of hormones. It's very, very powerful. Postnatal depression is often mistaken as exhaustion, so it's probably more than 10 to 15%. Um, and then perimenopausal mood disorder. 
45 to 68% of women will show depressive symptoms in perimenopause. Depression is, um, in, the diagnosis of depression has increased four to 16 fold in uh, this age group. There's a seven fold increase in suicide um, in women between the age of 40 and 50. And around 20% of women present to their GP with depressive symptoms. But it's an insidious presentation. Um, you know, the perimenopause uh, comes and goes. The, the over ovarian function can return to normal for a couple of months and then plummet. And of course, we all put things down to our lifestyle. Um, we're having a difficult time at work. We've got teenage children, sandwich generation, elderly parents. And they're often, you know, we... we, we we deny that actually there is any problems going on. We normalize our symptoms, um, and that's a really uh, very common situation. Um, often, mild symptoms uh, are, very, are very common, and with a lot of irritability and almost hostility, um, and poor sleep and exhaustion. Those are the sort of three things I think really stand out for me and why it's different from other mood problems or depression. And the typical features, I would say, would be paranoid thinking, actually, worried about what people think of you, worried about um, people talking about you behind the, your back, that sort of uh, paranoid type of thinking, decreased self-esteem, social isolation, that's really common. Uh, women just don't want to go out, they want to stay at home, they don't want to go out with their friends, they can't uh, motivate themselves to get up and, and socialise, heightened anxiety, overthinking, catastrophizing, losing logic sometimes about, about and their perception of situations can, can really be dramatically changed. Um, poor sleep, intrusive thoughts, um, including suicide. And this awful fatigue, like walking through treacle the whole time, even if they've had a good night's sleep. Um, so really, that's what the sort of typical features are of, of perimenopausal depression. And there's a, a Mano D questionnaire now, um, uh, produced by Professor Kulkarni in Australia, really to pick out the key features of perimenopausal depression compared with general depression. And I think it's the low energy, sleep disturbance and irritability um, particularly stand out. So the risk factors for perimenopausal depression would be prior depression, um, reproductive depression in the past, surgical menopause, shorter lifetime exposure to estrogen, so people have gone through an earlier menopause, um, uh, suffering with sleep disturbance and vasomotor symptoms, psychological factors, changes in family structures, um, and people who aren't taking HRT. So we need to be aware of, of, all, of all these things. And the problem is antidepressants do not work. They're not effective. It's not getting to the root problem, which is replacing and giving a secure level um, dose of estrogen for the brain and they should not be offered as first line that's nice guidance I'm sure we're all aware of that now the problem is after the WHI scare about HRT uh, the HR this is from Canada you can see the blue line is HRT the prescriptions plummeted overnight literally and as a result the, the rise in SSRI prescriptions was seen correspondingly and the other problem is with SSRIs, because they increase the dose of prolactin, um, they actually make the situation worse, um, because as you know, prolactin will um, dampen down the release of FSH and LH, reducing our hormone levels further. Um, it reduces libido, which is already reduced as well. So it actually makes things much worse. And someone who's hypoestrogenic, they'll become even more so with SSRIs. They can also have agitating effects. We heard from, from Hannah how, how bad she felt with the sertraline. Um, and they don't work. Um, and they cause sex, sexual dysfunction and, and lower libido. However, if you have a patient who has always suffered with clinical depression, um, SSRIs, of course, are appropriate and should be continued. But estradiol should be added in when they become perimenopausal because both of them working together are synergistic and they... they um, uh, improve efficacy and tolerability when both used together. HRT can effectively treat symptoms of depression, of uh, perimenopause and menopause. Of course it can. It's the reason it's happening is, is, the, is the deficiency of estrogen in our brains. Um, and it will 
if taken early and people have always had problems with depression, it help, can help prevent future depression. It can also help prevent relapse in major psychiatric um, problems. So it helps reduce uh, the incidence of psychosis um, relapse or bipolar relapse as well. So I just wanted to talk about a, a, a case. This is Sarah, who's age 50, and she has been feeling rather low and sad. And she put it down to the fact that it was empty nest syndrome, her children had left for university. Um, and she'd recently stopped work part-time as a midwife, actually, because she couldn't concentrate on things. Um, she felt uh, she was second-guessing herself all the time, didn't remember, um, felt exhausted, tearful at times, and her mood became lower and lower. Her husband worked long hours, and she was also a carer for her mother who has dementia, and it all became too much and overwhelming, so she felt she needed to stop her job. She wasn't performing as well, um, and... Um, and, and, and just take some time out caring for her, her mother. She had very poor sleep with early morning wakening. Um, her appetite had actually increased and she had put on weight, uh, certainly around the middle. Her self-esteem had gone to rock bottom and no confidence in herself. She became much more withdrawn as time went on, um, wouldn't go out, didn't accept any social invitations. And the anxiety was re got worse and worse and worse with catastrophizing. Um, she, she, as I said, she was housebound really almost with her anxiety at times. She wasn't driving um, and she felt so low and flat and this awful grey uh, feeling, absolutely no joy, anhedonia, um, nothing sparked or gave her joy or colour. And um, she had thoughts of self-harm, she didn't act on those, but she really felt what was the point of going on uh, feeling like this. So she was went to her GP and was diagnosed with clinical depression, as you can understand. She had early morning wakening, she had symptoms of low mood, she had thoughts of self-harm. And she was started on our usual things with sertraline, which gave her side effects. So then she was changed to venlafaxine, didn't really work, nothing helping. She went to see the psychiatrist. And because some days she felt better, she seemed to be cycling and, and, and feel, feel normal. And some days uh, much worse. She was uh, trialed on lithium as a mood stabilizer and even quetiapine because she was so agitated at times as well. They didn't really work. She had side effects from in that the next stage was uh, discussing ECT uh, for treatment resistant depression. Um, and she was very reluctant to do this, but she, she didn't know what else to do because she was feeling so desperate. Um, she had a review appointment with another clinician and they were wondering about hormones. They asked when her last period was and she said, well, they've been irregular the last two years. And she had Looking back on her history, she was on anti-inflammatories for her muscle and joint pains. Um, she ha had seen the GP several times because her migraines had worsened um, and she was taking sumatreptone two or three times a week as well as amitriptyline to try and prevent it. She'd suffered with tinnitus and was awaiting an MRI scan. Uh, she'd actually been referred to the rheumatologist as well because of her muscle aches and pains and they'd come up with a diagnosis of probable fibromyalgia. But she was on regular anti-inflammatories and a meprazole for the side effects. She also had dry eyes and had to stop wearing her contact lenses. And her libido was non-existent. And she also had incredible um, uh, vaginal dryness. So even sitting down was uncomfortable for her, let alone having intercourse, which wasn't, wasn't possible. She'd also had antibiotics uh, two or three times in the past two years for recurrent UTIs. So... The diagnosis was made, this was hormonal, um, which was quite right, because they stopped and looked back and saw the whole holistic sort of picture, uh, that it wasn't just her mood, there were other physical symptoms going on. She was on three or four medications and she was only 50. Um, we're having a huge problem with polypharmacy now. These medications didn't work, but she was too scared to stop them. Um, and she was started on transdermal estrogen and micronized progesterone and reviewed regularly here at our clinic. And her dose was optimized and tailored to her and her absorption rates. Um, she's also given local estrogen and Vagifem was used regularly. And six months later, we added in testosterone as well. And slowly she began to feel better. Her sleep began to improve. Um, she felt her her mood was on more of an even keel. She wasn't having the, the terrible uh, lows and, and, and felt much 
more like herself, so much so that she's able to stop the antidepressants. She also stopped her anti-inflammatories and the meprazole, and her migraines started to improve. In fact, nine months later, she felt back to normal. She'd applied for another job. Um, her relationship was back on track. She was now able to have um, intercourse. But more than that, she was communicating as she usually did with her husband um, and felt very much happier back in her relationship, and, and he was as well. And she was off all, all her medications. At one point, she'd been on four or five medications, uh, apart from HRT, of course, but she stopped everything else. So the benefits are, were huge. It's the most powerful medication I've ever prescribed, HRT, because it treats about seven or eight symptoms all at once. It's the safest medication I've ever prescribed. And um, it transforms women's lives. It is the most rewarding medicine um, I think I have ever done. And again with Sarah, she found that this was transformational. She was back at work. She'd taken promotion. Um, her relationship stopped all medications. Those benefits to the NHS. She'd had all those referrals to uh, migraine specialists, um, uh, cystoscopies, um, uh, seeing rheumatologists. Um, she'd been at the GP's door the whole time. You know, she, every, every month she was there, every two weeks when she was in distress. The crisis team, the psychiatrist she'd been referred to. The costs were huge. Um, her own finances had, had improved because she was back working. The f workplace um, had got a skilled uh, midwife back. Um, and, you know, God knows we need, we need all, the, all the skill we can get in the NHS. Benefits to society. She was contributing to GDP. She was closing the pension pe pay gap and the gender pay gap. You can see how her path could have gone a different way had she not gone down uh, the correct treatment and she could have ended up um, unemployed on five or six medications that weren't really helping. It's really extraordinary. And of course, for free, we know it improves symptoms and we know how safe HRT is for the majority of women. But for free, it's going to reduce her risk of future disease, osteoporosis. One in two women over the age of 50 will suffer with osteoporosis. 70% of hip fractures in women over 65 um, are in women over the age of 65. Um, diabetes, heart disease reduces by half because she started within 10 years of her final period. Um, osteoarthritis, depression and and death, all cause mortality is reduced. So an enormous benefit, yet only 14% of people are taking HRT. It seems absolutely crazy. So take home messages, sorry, I'm running over. Estrogen is an important modulator of neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, diagnosis of perimenopause and menopause is a clinical one, as we heard with Sarah. Um, mood disorder of menopause is very, very common. Symptoms ranging from mild to severe. HRT is the most effective treatment and we need to consider testosterone as well and how important that is in our brains. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've run over. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, the next speaker we've got is Dr. Sophie Berman, who's kind, she's a consultant psychiatrist. She's going to kindly talk to us about menopause management in mental health services. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I speak often to people in mental health services who know nothing about menopause, so it's been a bit of a gear shift to actually talk to people who know about menopause already. So I hope I don't patronise you. Um, so I'm a general adult psychiatrist. I work in the NHS in the city centre of Oxford, um, and I'm talking about the management of menopause in mental health services. I mean, I might as well have just had a slide which says nil or bad. <laughs> we don't do it. And I hope that is starting to change. And there are other psychiatrists, Louise is here, and I know there's other mental health professionals here, so that's fantastic. But we're right at the beginning of this change. This is very new in mental health services. Um, so to the extent, so I work in a team, I cover 18 to 65-year-olds, 50% of them are women. Obviously, quite a few are potentially perimenopausal. I got a medical student to do a bit of a start of a QI project looking at our numbers. And of the women we assess, um, so it's women, new people with new mental health problems coming to our team who are potentially perimenopausal, 40 to 65 we looked at. I was the only one who even asked them about periods, didn't ask about any symptoms of menopause, except the things which you'd expect with sort of psychological, the psychological symptoms. And then more astonishingly, we produce these great lengthy psychiatric histories. We talk about the names of their pet cats, but 
16% of these women were coming on HRT, so it was on their GP summary. Of those women, we, we lost the HRT in um, all but 6% of our discharge summaries. So we wrote this long medication history and we just left off the fact they were even on HRT. So not only are we not asking about um, menopause and HRT, we're actively avoiding thinking about it and taking it off our assessment letters. So there is a lot of work to be done here. Um, psychiatrists don't know much about menopause, with a few exceptions. Um, so yeah, we're, we're just beginning. Um, so why do, we, why do we need to care about menopause? Well, we broadly look after patients in two categories. Um, we've got those with the first episode of mental illness. So that's like the ones I was talking about in this audit. And then there's the ones with the severe and chronic mental illness. And sometimes we shorten that to SMI, severe mental illness. And those are patients who already, we know, have a very poor outcomes physically. They've got a high risk of early death and cardiovascular disease. Um, they're often sort of not very well in general. And what do we do with them? We often prescribe them antipsychotics. Um, uh, so we're hearing earlier about uh, antidepressants and SSRIs causing hyperprolactinemia. Of the patients I see, more of the issue is with the antipsychotics, which, with one exception, always cause hyperprolactinemia. Um, and what does that do? Well, that kind of any oestrogen we've got already floating around, and that causes for poor physical health outcomes. We worry about bones a lot in psychiatry. We don't do much about it, but we think about it and we worry about it. Um, but there are other, uh, other, as you know, other things which low oestrogen causes as well. And it gets a bit messy when patients are potentially perimenopausal and they're on a high dose of antipsychotics and their prolactin's really high. And that's just too much to think about. So, so we just, we, we tend to ignore it, but these are complex menopauses. They've got sort of an iatrogenic element. Um, and then if we look at it, um, as what happens to someone with severe mental illness entering the menopause. We know that patients who've um, experienced trauma um, often have worse symptoms of menopause, particularly the psychological symptoms, and have an earlier menopause. And we know that patients, uh, so people with low resilience, which is an, an awful term, um, but that's the term used in the, the studies, and that sort of poor psychosocial background, um, unstable uh, backgrounds, often have worse experiences of menopause. So this is, these are our patients, my patients, the patients with severe mental illness. We can expect that their menopause will be worse. And it works the other way as well. So as, a, as someone enters menopause, their estrogen's dwindling. Um, you know, as we heard about the effect on the neurotransmitters, it, it, the brain doesn't work in the same way. So where someone has been um, very stable, so perhaps they've got schizophrenia, they're on antipsychotic medication and they're well, they may well relapse in the perimenopause. When their oestrogen drops, the medication doesn't have the same effect on the brain. Uh, they need higher doses. I think of it like uh, sort of the oestrogen is a funnel, funneling the drugs to the right places. When you take out the funnel, you need to throw more drug at it to get, to get it to stick, get it to do it, um, the thing it's meant to be doing. Um, so they might need higher doses. We might call it treatment resistance. And there's an added bit to that as well. We give injections and we give tablet antipsychotics. The tablets are metabolised in the liver. There's also oestrogen receptors in the liver. And um, unsurprisingly, when the oestrogen drops, the liver's metabolism of the, the medication changes. So you also need a higher dose to get the same blood levels. And we don't measure blood levels for many antipsychotics. So as someone enters menopause, we've got sort of two ways in which their previously stable mental illness may then be destabilized, both the brain effects and the liver effects. And we just don't tend to think about this. We sort of scratch our heads about why women in their sort of late 40s, early 50s are suddenly being readmitted or suddenly relapsing. And it's quite an obvious factor. Once you've seen it, it becomes quite obvious. This is probably what's causing it. Um, and those are the first episode of mental illness. They're also important not to forget. And I'm not going to patronise you by telling you about the psychological symptoms associated with menopause. These are one step further. These are people who will reach caseness of a mental disorder. And it's, it's pretty much everything can, can be even unmasked. So ASD, um, that's autism spectrum disorders. ADHD can be unmasked in menopause. And you can get first episode of all sorts of other mental disorders. And both groups have poor mental health outcomes as well in, in menopause. Um, I've put treatment resistance um, in quotation marks because 
I'm not sure it always is treatment resistance. I think it's often we're giving the wrong treatment. And actually calling someone treatment resistance puts quite a lot of pressure and shame on them. They think, well, I'm not, I'm not working hard enough. I'm, I'm not trying to fight this. I'm not being resistant. But if you're giving someone, as, as we heard, antidepressants, which just don't work, um, they're not treatment resistant. They just haven't had the right treatment. I'm going to talk a bit more about suicidality as well a bit later, but it, it is a, a really sort of significant outcome um, for patients with mental illness in the, the perimenopause. And Another reason why we, we should care about this, you probably can't see the um, little writing on that. This is a very new document, which Louise has flagged up to me a few weeks ago. It's just come out. So this is from the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch. This is a, a governmental organisation looking at patient safety incidents. And this is a, a, a new report, including a case of a lady who very sadly died by suicide in the perimenopause after retreat, um, having sort of shed loads of um, treatment in the sort of like the Sarah case we just heard, but obviously had a very sad outcome. And the action points in it are mainly for the Royal College of Psychiatrists, actually, rather than individual trusts, but for the Royal College to start teaching people um, about the perimenopause and what to do about it. In, this is in particular in community mental health teams. So there's a new working party set up at the Royal College and hopefully with time that will get the ball rolling and we'll get psychiatrists and other mental health professionals actually talking a bit more about menopause. Um, so this is a homemade graph. So I'm thinking about the patients with a mental disorder and this is not the psychological symptoms. Um, so ignore the y-axis. Um, the bar chart bit is the average age of menopause in the UK and uh, as you, you know we're sort of 51 so you've got the peak around there. The other bits are other studies which I've overlaid over the top um, to sort of show visually how things change in the perimenopause. So we've got the dark blue line, um, that's suicides, that's the rate of suicides in England. And you can see there's a real uptick um, just in the perimenopause time. And that is the, that uh, demographic, um, women 40s to 50s, that's where rates of suicide are not falling. They are in other demographics, but not that one, um, which is very concerning got the green line and that's first episode of depression. Um, so we know that previous episodes of depression are a risk factor for perimenopausal depression. So that's even taking out those people. This is new depressive episodes. And again, there's this green line going up through the 40s, possibly linked to menopause. Um, the final was the orange line. Um, and this we've known about for, for ages. So this is um, first episode of schizophrenia. So you're sort of probably your image of schizophrenia might be a man in his 20s. And that is what we tend to see. So for men, they have a peak in their sort of early 20s and then the rates drop off. Women, there is also a peak in the 20s, not quite as high as men, but it's there and then it drops off. But then there's a quite a significant rise again in the perimenopausal period. But we don't treat this as anything different. We treat, this is just schizophrenia. We don't think maybe this is a different kind of schizophrenia. It's, it's all just treated as schizophrenia. But sort of for me, putting that together, it really sort of demonstrates there are things going on in the perimenopause. Whether we, we can say for sure that it's caused by menopause or not is perhaps a step too far, but it's a, an age group, a demographic we should really be thinking about a bit differently. Um, that leads me on to suicidality, which is somewhere we should do need to think differently. Um, so the, the, the table is showing rates of suicidal ideation. So that's people having suicidal thoughts, um, not necessarily acting on them, but just having thoughts around suicide in four different demographics. And this is um, adjusting for mental disorder. So we've got the premenopausal, postmenopausal and men. It's all roughly 1%. So that's people who are well just asked, have you had thoughts of suicide? I think it was in the last two weeks, maybe it's a month. And there's quite a striking rise in the perimenopause. I mean, the numbers are small in this study, and we, we do need more studies and to more women, but it's eight times higher. I mean, it doesn't mean that all of these women will ever do anything towards ending their lives, but just the fact that they're having these thoughts is really quite significant. Um, I'm sure many of you will be aware of different cases, including for Victoria Metcalf Smith, who's a, a lady um, who was perimenopausal, who sadly died by suicide. Um, she was in a neighbouring trust, and her story is is really powerful. So when talking to other mental health professionals, because it's like like the Sarah story we heard. It's people we see a lot of because they are often in distress and they're difficult patients because the treatments don't work. And when we get these very sad outcomes and, and think backwards to oh maybe we missed something, maybe we missed menopause. It's, it's really, really sad to think there was something simple we could have done or, or at least tried a lot earlier on. 
And suicidality in the perimenopause seems to be a bit different. And this is not based on any evidence because we, we haven't done the research. We know that people with perimenopause or depression are more likely to have on and off symptoms. So it's that, like why Sarah case was very helpful, illustrated a lot of, of my points, uh, was, was given lithium. So someone who is depressed in a sort of non-menopausal way, we expect them to be depressed consistently all the time. And if they're not, then we think, well, maybe it's something else. Maybe they're not actually that depressed. Maybe it's bipolar. Um, so we think about other things. But within the perimenopause, that seems to be quite common, that someone will feel absolutely awful. And then a few hours later, will be OK, maybe sort of feeling happy even. And when we hear that as psychiatrists, we don't quite know what to do with that. Um, so we might reach for the prescription pad and give them lithium. I wonder if the same is true for suicidality and that if someone might feel intensely suicidal at one point, then just doesn't at another point. And it's not, it's not their fault, it's just what is happening in, in their brain. But for our risk assessment, that makes it really challenging. Um, and I know in, in clinic you can see someone who seems fine and you think, oh great, the latest antidepressant, whatever it is I've given them, is working. And then a few hours later, they've done something awful, sort of attempted to end their life. And, and as a clinician, you sort of really start doubting yourself. And I think we just need to think about it differently. There's also the question of masking as well. And it's a demographic with a lot going on. There's a lot of stresses. And these are often people who cope and cope very well. And perhaps if they're not sort of been through mental health services, they're not saying things in the way we expect to hear them as psychiatrists. And again, we perhaps just don't pick up on really quite significant risks in this group. Um, so what happens to mental illness in the menopause? So this is people who already have a mental disorder. It's a very busy slide and I'm not going to go through all of it, um, but the references are there for anyone who's got particular interest. I mean, the headline is it all gets worse and it all gets a bit better, possibly with oestrogen. Um, so for schizophrenia, um, we know there's that uptick, there's these new, new, um, uh, new cases and also the new treatment resistance. And so what we think about doing is perhaps swapping people to depot, to injectable medication, because then you don't, you sort of bypass the liver problems and accept they will need a higher dose. Um, depression, again, there's not much evidence for, for treatment, but we do know that um, people get worse, people have new episodes, and as the MenOD points out, it's a slightly different kind of depression, more paranoia, more cognitive symptoms, more irritability, and I've mentioned the on-off phenomenon, and they need, people need higher doses of antidepressants to get the same effect. Um, bipolar, um, again, not much research, but it, it's, it's around um, increased episodes, so people sort of where they might have had sort of longer gaps between highs and lows, the gap shortens. Um, there's a question whether insomnia triggers some of that, so you think sort of sleep problems in the perimenopause are very common, and people with bipolar are very sensitive to, to poor sleep, so that, that might be a factor there as well. Um, as I've said, neurodiversity might be unmasked, and then the sort of the effects of trauma and um, can be sort of more pronounced in, in uh, menopause with increased vasomotor symptoms, which are also linked to anxiety. Um, so what is the role of HRT? Um, well, if we go by nice guidelines, we've got the anxiety symptoms and the low mood. But once you move beyond the, the symptoms, the psychological symptoms into disorders, there's no, there's no good um, uh, well, UK-based protocols to follow, and we have very little evidence. Um, there is a bit of in depression, and, and as we heard earlier, um, it, it, it seems to be that HRT works, particularly alongside antidepressants, could be as a standalone treatment, but that's not made it onto um, formularies. It's not made it into NICE guidelines. If you take your NICE guideline for depression or our trust um, medication sort of uh, flow chart, at no point does it prompt you to think about perimenopause. And I think this is something which really needs to change. We need to do both at once. We need to treat, use our antidepressants, but also think about HRT. Um, same goes for, for psychosis. There's only really case studies which look at the benefits of HRT in many menopausal onset um, psychosis. There is evidence in people who um, are not menopausal, who have schizophrenia, that oestrogen helps. And we've, we've heard it's a neuroprotectant. It makes sense, but we just don't have the studies. Um, there is an interesting study into the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So in schizophrenia, you get the positive symptoms, which are your classics sort of delusions, your hallucinations. But the bit which is often really hard to treat is the sort of the apathy, the sort of um, cognitive blunting. 
And the fact that HRT might help that, and in an observational study it has helped, is really significant because this is often the bits which hold people back. You can get on top of their hallucinations, but if they can't get on with their life, you haven't really achieved much, and HRT really could help here. Um, so what does um, menopause care look like for serious, uh, severe mental illness? Um, so it's a really good opportunity, I think, to optimise patients' uh, physical health and mental health. They're already, this population, I'm thinking, are already at huge risks um, with their mental health. And we know the medications are less effective. Um, there's a huge risk of diagnostic overshadowing. So um, when I've sort of put up my hand and said, should we try some hormones? It's always, oh, no, 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 let's sort out the schizophrenia, the depression first, then we can think about the HRT. And that's wrong. There's also the, the, the problem of someone who has chronic mental illness, everyone sees them just in that light. So someone with schizophrenia who says they're starting to feel anxious, we want to put, increase their antipsychotics. We think about it in the context of schizophrenia rather than they might also be menopausal. And we know that women with severe mental illness have reduced rates of HRT prescriptions, and that's even before um, my team have just forgotten about it entirely. And that's, that's wrong. We need to support women seeing their GPs or thinking about H HRT because they're not necessarily going to do it themselves. And we don't want to leave it too late. And I have lots of patients on my caseload where I feel really sad that they are now in their late 50s, early 60s and have had a really rough 10 years of admissions, serious illness, stopped work, problems in the family, lost their kids. And they've lost out on those periods of their life. If HRT works now, that's, that's great, but we need to be thinking proactively. And when someone starts relapsing in their 40s, that's when we think about HRT and good menopause treatment. Um, so my vision for the future, um, so education. So there's, there's lots of us trying to get the word out there and it, it's a huge blind spot in psychiatry and um, mental health professionals. We, we just don't ask about it, we don't think about it, but once people have started, then you see it everywhere. So we're, we're working with the Royal College to get um, e-learning packages and I know Olivia is working very hard on that. Um, Claire and I have written a paper, we're, we're trying to get the word out there. Um, and collaboration is really important. So we're a long way before psychiatrists are going to feel happy prescribing HRT. But if we can get sort of, um, if we can work on collaborating with GPs, I think that might be the way forward. Um, and, and thinking of the psychotropic medication alongside HRT. And then research, obviously always more research is needed, but it really is here, and really particularly for women with severe mental illness. Um, we've heard about testosterone, I think that really could be key um, for it, obviously all the psychological symptoms associated with that. Um, but the first step is getting women with severe mental illness at least onto HRT. Um, and then there's a bit about suicidality as well, and we really need to get a better handle on what uh, suicidality looks like in the perimenopause. And I think we need qualitative research there to find out what is it really like for, for women who are having these awful suicidal thoughts, and then change how we approach them and change how we think about risk. Um, so it, it is a positive vision. It will get better because it's, we're just beginning, and I, I really hope that Next conference will be a lot more psychiatrists here and the, um, it, it really is the beginning of a change. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie. So we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion now if all of the speakers want to come back up. And we've also got um, Dr. Louisa Levitt joining us, who's a, another consultant psychiatrist. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've got some of the questions that you've kindly sent in on the Slido app. So I've picked out some of the ones that are relevant to the discussion we've had this morning. So um, there's one for, I think anyone can answer, but I was thinking it might be a good one for Hannah. But <laughs> So I've noticed in practice that perimenopausal women still have a week where they can feel absolutely awful. Is this related to endogenous changes of oestrogen? Yes, I think, uh, as um, Rebecca also said, the, the late luteal phase, the week before your period, both oestrogen is dropping and progesterone is dropping and actually topping up either during that week or actually just increasing the dose throughout the whole cycle to try and balance the hormones is definitely worth considering doing. And I think younger women who are still having periods in perimenopausal, they often do need that higher dose in order to balance everything out rather than just replace what's missing once the periods have stopped. 
Mm. Would you agree? I would agree, actually. When you see this fluctuation we saw on that graph, um, actually we need to give enough to, st to dampen that fluctuation and give a flat line um, for that stability and, and deliverability of estradiol throughout the body. So we do have to go on higher doses and make sure that that fluctuation settles. can be dropped in time, but that's what I would do, yeah. Mm. Uh, this sort of this question sort of leads on from that. Um, a private menopause consultant recommended for a patient no need for progesterone, are still getting monthly bleeds. Say she will produce her own progesterone. Do you have any thoughts? If you want to answer that, Rebecca. I have heard um, if someone is having regular periods and they're ovulating um, and they're topping up uh, in the luteal phase for PMS. Um, then in theory there's no reason to have a progesterone because they're already producing it um, for, from their own body naturally. And if their periods are very regular, some people ha may, may just start with a low dose of oestrogen and as long as their period cycle is regular, they will of course therefore be producing enough endogenous progesterone to protect their endometrium. Um, so I think it's a very individual approach really and that's discussed with, with patients perhaps. I don't I haven't particularly done that myself, but I can see how that how some people could do that. But but the patient has to be mindful. As soon as the periods change, um, it's not reliable the, the production of progesterone, and we would then have to add in progesterone. Um, so you know, because some people have a lot of progesterone intolerance, um, and that's a way to avoid adding in progesterone, perhaps in the very early stages. of of perimenopause but any changes in periods we need to be protecting the endometrium with progesterone um, exogenous progesterone mm. um, this one perhaps is a good one for louisa and sophie um, since lockdown although it would be i think it covers all of us but since lockdown i've noticed a marked increase in anxiety low mood fatigue and insomnia in all ages and sexes are we at risk of overdiagnosis in the young? So I think that perhaps refers to overdiagnosing, perhaps a hormonal <laughs> component to that. But I wondered what either of you might have thought about it yeah. in general. I, would, I mean, I would agree. We are seeing a lot more anxiety um, and a lot more sort of social anxiety and things like that, and especially in teenagers. I think the key is with any medicine, really, that the, the answers are often in the history. Um, and if you don't ask the questions about hormones, you're not going to know. But there's lots of other, like we, we're using the MenOD a lot more and thinking about how, um, how we take our history, really. Um, and as we've heard, it's not always about treating, you know, we might need to use antidepressants, we might need to use um, hormones, but there's also other, lots of other lifestyle things and they would come perhaps in, in sort of low grade anxiety, you would be thinking more around lifestyle or, or psychological interventions, but it's always, about, it's always about the history and there's usually some other signs and symptoms in the history um, that hormones are, are important. Mm. Would you agree? Yes. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's about taking that good history and yeah, looking at family history as well. And any sort of markers like the, you said, the reproductive depression, I think it's reproductive, all symptoms. You can get reproductive anxiety. It's what that patient looks like when they are in a mm. hormonal change or hormonal episode, whatever it is, whether it's cyclical or to do with pregnancy or, or the perimenopause. But yeah, it's picking up the clues. You're right. Mm. And the other thing I suppose to say is uh, <clears throat> over-diagnosing. We've got to be very careful that we don't misdiagnose of early uh, perimenopause because, of course, all those health risks which are there for all of us over the age of 51 are much increased in the younger woman under the uh, age of 45. There's an increased mortality. So what would be dreadful, of course, if this was ignored, um, the hormonal problems in a 40-year-old and, you know, age 60, they have an MI or uh, fracture a, a hip and, uh, you know, they that there will be serious consequences or increased mortality. So we just have to be mindful of that. And quite often, it, as you say, it's a history. That's the, the, the beauty of medicine. It's the art of medicine. It's listening. It's not just looking at those symptoms of, of, of fatigue and anxiety. It's looking at everything else. Come on, we're, we're GPs. We're good at that. We look at the holistic approach and we, we, we look at other, other symptoms. Um, and I think I think that's key. And sometimes it's difficult if it is it is it hormones or isn't it hormones. So quite often I say to women, look, because I don't want to miss an early one. Why don't we trial HRT and we re reassess in three months? And if they say, my God, I'm sleeping well, my muscle aches and pains, you're you're onto something, aren't you? So I think I think we have to have that conversation with patients as 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 as, as our partners. I think, I think patient awareness is much uh, much greater since 
COVID and social media, that women are understanding about these symptoms, they're coming to ask about these symptoms, whereas before they would come in with a different set of symptoms, but really they were anxiety, fatigue, menopausal symptoms, but now they're, they're much more aware, so they're willing to talk openly about them, and, and perhaps that's a factor mm. as well. Mm. We always saw these women, um, mm. people say we're medicalising, yeah. over-medicalising, but these women were medicalised. Look at our case history, Sarah, she was massively medicalised on, on polypharmacy. These women have always come, um, but they've, it's, a, it's the mistress of, dis, of disguise, isn't it, perimenopause? But they've been slotted into um, fibromyalgia, um, de depression, uh, recurrent migraineurs, and they've, they've, they've come to us regularly. Um, but now they're realising that and coming as one, th as one thing, perhaps this is my hormones. I think as well as Sophie said, psychiatry's got a lot of catching up to do. So I think probably the reverse is much greater risk for, from our point of view, is that by the time patients get into secondary mental health services, mm. they're either somatizers or they've got a personality disorder or they're yeah. hysterical. Mm. Um, and actually we're missing, I think yeah. in secondary mental health, we're missing hormones. and. And I'm guilty of it myself in the past as well. The number of l women that will come to us and say, I think this is my hormones, often they know themselves. They, they yeah. often have yeah. that sense that this is hormonal yeah. and this isn't a mental illness, or why have we been not sure why I've been sent to see you? Mm. It's because my GP doesn't know what to do with me, or because mm. um, you know, the rheumatologist hasn't mm. cured my fibromyalgia mm. or whatever it is. So I think actually the converse is is more of a risk, it's more of a concern to me as a psychiatrist that we are missing women and actually when we look at the suicide statistics mm. it's not just about well-being and quality of life it is actually you know a, serious, a serious mm. in in some mm. people mm. completely and it, yeah if the women do go to the gp and say i've i've got you know, hormonal problems they probably won't come to a psychiatrist they'll have been treated before they get to us so mm. it might be that we we don't see them we only see the ones which are missed i guess mm. Do you find that patients, might, if you introduce hormone, the idea of hormones and they perhaps haven't considered it themselves, is it something they welcome or can it be quite difficult for you to introduce? I, mean, I, th I think in, in my service, I work in acute mental health, so we try and mimic in the community what, what patients receive if they go into hospital. So we do do routine physical health screening, but even though I'm talking about it all the time in my team, we still haven't managed to take that step to ask every woman about the menopause or look at menopause screening we do ask them about their last menstrual period often it just says brackets regular um, and we do ask them if they're taking contraception but i think that's that's a, a hangover really more from the fact of what if we give them something like sodium valparate and they might be yeah, of childbearing age or, or pregnant i don't think it's really because we're thinking about the broader aspect of hormones and their presentation mm. um, i think women most women that I've introduced to or started talking to have been really grateful and we've often facilitated conversations with their general practitioners as a result of that. Um, and I think there's, you know, a lot of my patients will say, can you test my hormones? So then there's a lot of work around talking about why that might not be helpful. And there have, I can think of patients whose um, estradiol levels have been quite high. And actually when we've, we've seen them maybe for their second episode of home treatment in three months, we've then thought we're missing something. And often, as you know, Claire, I contact Claire a lot and say, can you help me? Um, and we've worked together and that's been really productive and we've seen really positive um, outcomes for patients who have had both the benefits of um, psychotropic medication alongside HRT. I'm afraid my experience isn't always that positive, actually. I mean, I, I find that when I, have, I yeah, went into this thinking, oh, brilliant, I can cure all these people, all they need is HRT. And the uptake was, was lukewarm. So they're sort of, people want the big strong drugs. They want the ones with the Zs in, the, the big, heavy, <laughs> dangerous Why? psychiatric drugs. Why? Because I think it means, feels that they're being Validate. taken seriously. I mean, you, I, I don't think I do this, but you can approach it the wrong way and go, oh, that's all your hormones. You're like sort of out of clinic. This isn't, you, you're not allowed in here. And so I think I have had patients who have reluctantly tried HRT sort of, had a low dose patch for a week or two, thought it didn't work, so stopped it, and then that's it. So I think there is work to, done, to be done changing the mindset, getting people on it, and then staying on it, adjusting it. You know, it's not going to necessarily work as soon as you put it on. But yeah, there are patients where it does help as well. And I think that probably is the majority and it's the sort of the mindset and the culture shift we need to no, get. We, we, need, we need to get that out, uh, yeah. you know, everywhere, medically and in society, how devastating the symptoms can be. Mm. 
because I think they might feel slightly insulted. I'm really sick mm. and have hormones. That's just for lifestyle yeah. and yeah. having nice skin. You know, this is yeah. this is ridiculous. And and you know, the, the suicide from from perimenopause is incredibly serious and the devastating effects. And I think we need to get that out. And I think it is getting out, but uh, got more work, more work to do. Mm -hmm. Leading on from that, perhaps you did mention um, contraceptive. Another question we've had is, do natural hormones work better than synthetic hormones in birth control pills? I think this is perhaps a group of women where um, this would apply. I'm not sure. Do I wish there was a natural combined contraceptive yeah. pill because I would prescribe it all the time. Yeah. But apart from um, Clara, which has got body identical oestrogen, they've all got a synthetic progesterone, which unfortunately people don't get on so well with. So maybe that's something that might be coming mm. out in the future, hopefully. And of course, if it's oral, even if it starts as body identical, it's all metabolised by the liver to four or five different types of oestrogens, which aren't, uh, aren't always great. Estrone is not a good oestrogen. It's from, produced from fat cells. It's pro-inflammatory. Um, we want 17 beta oestradiol, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the one. Mm. Um, a lot of the others are more relevant to the other sessions. I don't know if anyone's got any questions that they want to ask us. Um, uh, my name's Eric Watson. I'm a consultant obstetrician gynecologist in Birmingham, the West Midlands. It's more of an observation following on from the questions. I probably don't need that. Um, following on from the, the question about the, uh, the, the private menopause doctor saying about not needing the progesterone. My area of sort of special interest rather, I'm not a subspecialist or anything like that, is oncology. So we're seeing a lot of patients with um, unscheduled bleeding on HRT, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the myths out there, and it might not be in this audience because of people's interest, is that if you have a, a month of unopposed oestrogen, you're gonna have endometrial cancer. To go from uh, a normal endometrium to a uh, hyperplastic endometrium uh, to a cancerous endometrium is probably going to take years. It, it's not going to be so, so you know, the, the, the classic is, oh, there, myrena has been in for five years. Oh, my God. You know, they've got to have extra progesterone to protect. You know, if you're not having periods with your myrena, you're not having periods, your endometrium is protected. And if that's seven, eight, nine years down the line, it's fine. Um, the, the, the issue with giving somebody a lot of estrogen with natural cycles is they're probably almost instantly their periods are going to get heavier. So is, is giving them um, an additional progesterone may not be the answer. Putting a Mirena in, I'm a bit of a Mirena enthusiast, but putting a Mirena in to protect the endometrium in that situation. If their periods carry on being exactly the same, you're probably okay. But I would suspect 99 times out of 100 going with that regimen, their periods won't be the same. Their periods will get heavier or erratic quite quickly. So, you know, that would be the thing. But that's not the same as saying they're going to instantly have an endometrial cancer. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later they will, but, you know, it'll be a lot later probably. So uh, I hope that helps people. Yeah, thank you. Um, could you just comment again on the cyclogespessaries? Because I looked at the BNF and it's really confusing because it says in brackets, not recommended. What's that all about? Okay. <laughs> so um, Catherine Dalton was around in the, the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s and she treated loads of women with postnatal depression and premenstrual syndrome with cyclogest 400 milligrams twice a day. She was not an advocate of randomised controlled trials because it was generally before the days of evidence-based medicine. And also she felt that 50% of women would not get the appropriate treatment. So there's never been a randomised controlled trial proving the benefits. There were a couple of small trials of strange doses that showed no benefit. And so we haven't got the randomised control evidence that this is beneficial, but it has got a licence. So... I can understand it's not in any of the treatment guidelines or pathways and you, you might not therefore want to consider it, but it is something that can help many women. I've used it in general practice on and off intermittently over the last 10 years and everyone who's used it has got better uh, and I don't know anyone who's got worse. So it isn't something that we would say, yes, go ahead and use. It's just to be aware of the work and, um, and that it is a licensed product for those, treat those illnesses. Hello, I'm Anna I'm one of the GPs at Newson Health. Um, I was also about cyclodespessaries, and I was 
when you're if you are going to trial them would you consider them just for women who were very symptomatic in that section before their period because obviously some women can be progesterone intolerant in PMS and PMDD so are you trying to take a really detailed history to tease those women out or is it more sort of trial and error so we are beginning to sort of offer PMS um, service. And so for the younger women who are not yet perimenopausal, they could consider cyclogest for, 40, from, for 14 days. So for the luteal phase to kind of balance out their progesterone levels in the same way we balance out estrogen levels. So using it in that, in that sense. Um, but actually what we're often finding, um, and some of, some of the patients at Newton Health are actually starting to use cyclogest as the progesterone element of their HRT, and they're using it as if um, either cyclically if they were perimenopausal or even continuously. And, you know, it's, we've only got small numbers, but we have had some positive experiences, haven't we? So I think, it, like we've said, it's taking a good history and actually having the flexibility to make a... HRT regime that suits the patient within the, the realms of the knowledge that you've got and uh, around them. I mean, I just went and made up my own HRT. I didn't really know what I was doing, but it seemed to work. Um, and, and, and that's why I, I use it quite a lot. And actually, it's quite useful having a higher dose of progesterone because um, Louise sent me a study recently showing that using vaginal eutrogestan gave you a blood level of progesterone of nine milligrams Whereas if you took 100 milligrams orally and it was metabolized, it gave you a blood level of two uh, nanograms. So actually, is progesterone tolerance a progesterone deficiency? I don't have the answer to that, but many of these women may need actually a lot more progesterone than they're currently being given. And it would helpfully protect the endometrium as well. I got a few patients who would want to take like SSRI only for half of their cycle uh, for uh, a PMS. For these kind of patients, should I be doing that more or should I be doing the progesterone more? What would be the better result? So the, um, the guidelines from the National Association of Premenstrual Syndrome and the RCOG would say the first line treatments are the Yasmin combined contraceptive pill, if it's not contraindicated, and SSRI cyclically. Second line treatments is transdermal estrogen with a um, appropriate progesterone. So progesterone alone does not fall into any of the guidelines, but it is something that is safe and can be effective and does has a license. So it's something to consider if other things perhaps haven't worked. Um, I mean, I often say to the patients, read, read the books. There's some really fantastic books by Catherine Dalton, and um, one of them's called The PMS Bible, another one's called Once a Month. They read it and they go, God, this is me all over. And then they have the confidence to say, well, actually, let's give this a go if other things aren't working. Thank you. To take one more question and then we've got a break. There will be opportunity for questions again. Um, Hi. Um, I'm Nadir, I'm a GP working in Bolton. Um, in a couple of the talks this morning, the importance of progesterone in um, reproductive depression was really highlighted. And I just wondered, in women who've had a hysterectomy and you feel like they've got a perimenopausal depression, would you still consider using progesterone as well as estrogen? Or would you first see how they responded to estrogen and then review? Do you want to answer that? Yes, um, yeah, good question. Yes, the answer is yes, we do use progesterone in people who've had hysterectomy um, because, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a Marmite sort of hormone at the dose of 100 milligrams um, orally. Some women feel worse with it um, and, and get bloating and irritability and, and, and feel dreadful, perhaps because their levels are too low, we've just heard, we don't, we don't know. But um, uh, some people find it really helpful because of the effect on anxiolysis and sleep and they really like it and it really helps soothe and calm. So some people, you know, in the perimenopause, um, they're, they're on a good, do reasonable dose of estrogen and perhaps have testosterone, have had a hysterectomy, you know, and their sleep is really bad and they're still having anxiety, then I, I certainly would, would add it in as a trial. Um, to see if they want, you know, that the brain works better with all the balance of all three hormones. Yeah. Thank you. 
So thank you very much to all of our panellists. We've got a 20 minute break now. There'll be refreshments in the front. If you want to go out the side door, we're going to hopefully fit the, fix the back door while we're in break. <laughs> Can I just say thank you, because it's been a very depressing start. Every time I hear Hannah's story, I do want to cry, but most of you who see menopausal women will hear stories equally, if not more harrowing. So it's really, really important, and it just shows that all of us respond so differently to hormones, and there's so much more that we need to do. Many of you also know that I really like connections, and uh, Catherine Dalton went to my old school. I went to a really strict, horrible boarding school when I was 10, and uh, she came to talk when I was 13 at the school. And um, yeah, life works in circles, doesn't it? So anyway, she was very ahead of her time, and if you do read her books, which I think now are quite hard to get hold of, <laughs> poor, poor lady would have got a lot more royalties if she was still alive. But it's phenomenal, actually, what she's read, um, what she's written, and we really need to, to, to learn from other people who have been ahead of their game in the past. So thank you again. Just want to give a round of applause. For them.